This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you so much, Chelsea. That is, you know, at this point, I've given quite a few seminars, but it was by far my favorite introduction. I've got a heavily like goosebumps right now, so that feels really good. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity to invite anybody who um, wants to, you don't have to, I want you to feel no pressure, but to turn on your video just so I can have somebody to engage with. I have a whole whole screen of names right now, many of which are familiar, but many who aren't. So if you're in a place where or you want me to see your reactions to the research I present, absolutely turn your videos on. And so today I'm going to tell you guys, as Chelsea alluded to, all about the research I've done on neotropical plant evolution. Before I dive into the Andes, I'm going to paint a picture of um, the neotropics writ large. And so the neotropics are the region of the world between the, the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn in the Western Hemisphere, stretching from northern or southern Mexico in the north and Chiapas down to northern Argentina in the south, wrapping around to include the, the Caribbean islands. And for biodiversity, they're an incredibly important part of the world. Uh, there are between 90 and 110,000 species of vascular plants that are native to the neotropics. And to put this into a broader um, global context, this means that the neotropics may hold more plant species than the entirety of the African and Asian tropics combined. So really quite stunning levels of neotropical diversity. And because I'm in a plant biology department, I know you guys know a bunch of plants from this region, but here are some, um, some of the plants that are probably more familiar to, to you, but also maybe to the people who aren't plant biologists in your life. A bunch of um, charismatic tropical fruits like papayas and pineapples, but also kitchen staples like um, potatoes and chilies. And the neotropics is as many of the sort of uncontroversial, uncontroversially wonderful plants it has. Also have some more controversial ones as well, including the coca leaf, which is um, so important for the medical industry, but is also quite infamous for, for the drug trade. Um, but as a botanist, when I think of the neotropics, this is more like the plant diversity that I think of. The neotropics are home to almost all species of cacti, bromeliads, and of course the heliconias that I wet my teeth on as an undergrad in Chelsea's lab. Um, and, uh, and plants that might be less familiar as well, including things like this big leaf gunnera, this formerly topa bea, now Blackia species being pollinated by an orchid bee, and many, many species of the primarily tropical order Malpighiales, including this Anthodiscus species here. And a major question that drives my research, but also plenty of other folks' research, including I think people in your department who are coming at it from a totally different angle than me, is what explains this neotropical hyperdiversity? There are of course abiotic explanations that include simply time and area that the neotropics are both big and old, but also climate and aspects of the landscape themselves, including hydrology and, and mountain uplift. And prominently today, my talk will feature um, Andean uplift. But there are plenty of biotic factors as well that may underlie diversification, plant diversification in this region, including things a little bit inherent to the species, like potential to hybridize or deform polypoids, um, also adaptations to, to soil environments and other parts of the abiotic niche, and of course, biotic interactions, uh, whether they're mutualisms with pollinators or seed dispersers or um, antagonisms, like the relationship between um, plants and their herbivores. And if you know my research, you know I'm sort of stuck on one of these potential or one of these uh, biotic mutualisms, hummingbird pollination. And I think this is a really good example of how the, the neotropics have just such fantastic bio biological interactions ongoing throughout um, their entire landscape. And so many plants have converged to take advantage of this particular pollinator. And to get at um, what drives neotropical plant evolution. My research program takes a clade-focused approach, um, but is very integrative across subclades of biology, of, of especially of evolution. And I integrate macroevolutionary studies with microevolution, um, with species ecology, my research program, sort of at that, that happy zone right there in the middle. But importantly, my research is always conducted in a systematic context. So understanding phylogenetic relationships, as well as having a solid understanding of alpha taxonomy, underlies all the research that I do. 
And this, of course, means that herbarium specimens are central to the work that I do. Um, a lot of the data I will present to you today came either in part or in whole from herbarium specimens. And so they're just such an important um, source of data for the evolutionary biologist, in addition to being an important um, a place for a, a taxonomist to really get to understand a group in its complexity. And so my, my research program, now that I have my own lab at LSU, takes a two-pronged approach. My first prong is to go really deep into a single model clay to try to understand the evolutionary processes that give rise to um, Andean biodiversity. And here I use the neotropical bellflowers. And that's, this will be the most of my talk today. But there's also a second prong that in which I um, am trying to understand taxonomy uh, phylogeny and evolution of, of groups that are totally understudied. The neotropics for being as species rich and um, rich in their interactions as they are, are surprisingly understudied um, in a, from a phylogenetic perspective. So I'm going to hop in and tell you a little bit about that first prong right now. Um, the neotropical bellflowers are what I consider emerging model clay to understand Andean plant evolution. They comprise about 600 species total across three different subgroups. The core genera that I'll spend most of my time talking about today are Centropogon, Burmeistera, and Cyphocampolis. Collectively, these genera are sister to a group of high elevation endemic taxa in the genus Lysopomia. Um, and together, those two are sister to four species of Lobelia down in Chile, the, 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 the tupas. Um, it's a truly neotropical group going from Mexico down through Argentina, um, but their species richness is by far highest in the cloud forests of the Andes. And this group across its about 600 species, not surprisingly, is very diverse in its ecology and morphology. And I think the floral diversity in this clade really exemplifies that. Here are some of the species that I've been lucky enough to collect throughout fieldwork in the neotropics. Um, this is Lysopomia, that, uh, that high elevation endemic I mentioned, has a teeny flower that's probably bee pollinated. Um, but the rest of the flowers on this slide are vertebrate pollinated, whether they're pollinated by hummingbirds in these bright colors here, or by bats in these more dull colors. And this impressive floral diversity is paratune equally impressive, though um, maybe less colorful diversity in overall growth form. And here again, I'm going to mention really fast, this is Lysopomia shown here out in the wild and there's some moss behind it for scale. So it's a really tiny little plant, um, but it occurs in the same overall sub uh, clade as Cyphocampus tunarensis. It's not a huge tree, but it's still a tree with a pretty substantial single bowl. Um, and growth form within this clade sort of spans that entire gamut, whether we're talking about xerophytes that are growing in the Guiana Shield, uh, hemiepiphytes growing, in, or hemiepiphytes in the genus Burmeistera, or um, this sort of Dr. Seuss-like uh, monocala shrub thing that's holding on to its um, senesced leaves. So really just a fantastic group to, to get to study evolution in. And as I alluded to, systematics is at the heart of, of my research. So understanding how these 600 species should be delimited and how their species are related is really important. So of course, part of my research does involve going into the field and into the herbarium and describing new species. Um, but it also involves establishing a phylogenomic or phylogenetic and, and more recently phylogenomic framework to understand relationships that can be used to then understand macroevolutionary patterns. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the work that I've done in establishing the phylogeny of this group. Uh, sorry about that. You probably saw my Twitter a little. Um, thanks, Feiwei. <laughs> um, anyway, so the I'm going to tell you about where what I've done, research I've done in phylogenetics, but also um, the the work that's ongoing. And this is, I think, a strand of my research that will always have something active going on. You know, I will always be trying to understand more and more about this group of, of species. As I mentioned at the beginning, as a whole, they can be um, subdivided into three major clades. And it turns out that geo um, geography is really informing relationships in this clade. And for example, we found that Caribbean species of Cyphocampylus are actually really distantly related from the other members of its closely allied genera um, in the mainland. And so this green clade I've highlighted here is 
what we've come to refer to as a Sancho Pargano clade. And this is the group of about 500 species uh, that's really uh, diverse in their um, ecology and morphology. Here I'm showing you the, the phylogeny at, at the left, and you can immediately notice that there's only, only one monophyletic genus here. Um, Burmeistera um, is in green is monophyletic, and this monophyly is well supported by um, molecular phylogenetic analysis. But further, it's supported by um, morphological synapomorphies as well. This includes a dilated anther orifice. So unlike other labelioidae, it doesn't close its anther tube. Um, that's an adaptation probably to bat pollination. And as is this inflated corolla opening that it has, it also has isodiametric seeds. So it's, you know, well-established clade. The other two genera, however, are polyphyletic and sort of wildly so with respect to one another, with centropogon forming eight separate subclades and cyphocampolis 11. Now, this is a reflection of this artificial taxonomy that's based on fruit type. Like Burmeistera, centropogon produce these animal dispersed berries, and cyphocampolis, on the other hand, produces these capsules that are abiotically dispersed. Maybe wind occasionally takes them up and, and takes them far, but mainly they're probably just gravity dispersed. Um, aside from these two traits, these genera overlap in pretty much all um, characters, whether vegetative or, or reproductive. So this striking non-monophyly um, is not necessarily surprising but it does underlie a really interesting macroevolutionary trend, which is that fruit evolution has been incredibly dynamic within this clade. From an ancestral um, capsular state, we see the independent evolution of, of berries about eight times independently. And each of these eight evolutions is associated with the origin um, of a well-supported, morphologically well-defined clade. And just to show you sort of the end product of the um, convergent evolution of berries, um, I've, I've put up examples of five of those subclades here. These are all um, either in Burmeistera here or Centropogon. And I think these are useful in showing the fact that, yes, these are all berries. They're all fleshy fruits with many, many seeds. Um, but that convergent evolution in function is not necessarily reflected in convergent evolution in form. And there's actually quite a lot of variation in the, in the full morph or the fruit morphology in this group. So we're continuing to um, build a phylogenetic framework for this group, both at the broad level and an undergraduate, Lauren Frankel has been really helpful there, and at more targeted lineages. And my graduate student, Janet Mansory, has been working on establishing the phylogeny of a subclade of, of Centropogon here. And my, our current work uses targeted sequence capture, um, which is a method that is really robust to low quality DNA, which is important because um, we use a lot of herbarium specimens as a major source of DNA um, because with 600 species, even though even back when field work was possible, it's really hard to get full sampling across the neotropics via field work. And so this method has been really great for us, even though herbarium specimens aren't always a, a panacea to getting really great data, they are um, useful. So herbarium samples perform poorly compared to silica um, dried samples, even in targeted sequence capture. We see that the total number of assembled base pairs in our data set is less in herbarium specimens as compared to um, silica dried leaf tissue that we sequence from. The average contact length is lower and the number of really long contacts similarly is lower. But yet, they've done a really good job at allowing, it, this method has done a really good job of allowing us to put new species into the tree that I failed at previously. And this includes these three species here. Um, Cyphocampolis planchonis is a species that's endemic to Venezuela. So even if I could go to the field right now, I wouldn't be able to collect silica tissue for this species because of the, the sociopolitical situation in Venezuela. But thanks to Missouri Botanical Garden, I was able to incorporate, incorporate it into a phylogeny here. Similarly, we were able to include Centropogon electrolophus, a new species that I'm describing with Bruce Stein into, into the phylogeny, and as well as my, my white whale, uh, Cyphocampolis nobilis, I've been trying to include in a phylogeny since I was a graduate student because I just love its linear leaves, but wasn't able to when I was using Sanger sequencing, but we now have it pretty well resolved.
I should say really quickly that our phylogenomic analyses really broadly agree with um, the, the first phylogeny I showed you. So while we're continuing to add information, the, the overall story of evolution in, in the central part on enclade is, is really consistent. So we've used this phylogeny to really understand macroevolution in this clade, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we've looked at the abiotic and biotic drivers of diversification in this clade, especially in the context of the Andes. So I want to introduce you even further to the tropical Andes, which um, the Andes themselves are a continental scale mountain range stretching from Venezuela down through Patagonia, but the tropical Andes sort of end at the, in northern Argentina. Um, there are global biodiversity hotspot that um, spans about, or that encom encompasses about 1.5 kilometers, million squared kilometers, um, which is less than 1% of the world's terrestrial surface. However, the tropical Andes are home to 15% of all angiosperm diversity. Fully 40,000 species of, of angiosperms are native to this region. And this high level of species richness is paired with high endemism. So it's a really special area. And the uplift of the Andes geologically is pretty recent, at least in the, the tropical um, parts of the Andes, which in northern Colombia, you can argue are still <laughs> uplifting and they definitely have been very active in the last million years. So this, this process of really active recent uplift has been invoked time and time again to explain elevated diversification rates in really distantly related clades, including um, hummingbirds, glass-winged butterflies, and these glass frogs. And in the plants world, <laughs> I think time after time again, this has been established, but perhaps most famously, we can think of the Andean lupins, which hopped down from um, Mexico about one and a half million years ago into South America and diversified into more than 80 species pretty quickly. But I think it's important to consider that the Andes, the tropical Andes, are not one monolithic habitat type, but are instead have a whole lot of habitat heterogeneity within them. And here are four of the distinct habitat types that characterize this region. At the highest part of the Andes, there are high elevation grasslands characterized, characterized by lots of grasses and sedges that form, um, that form tussocks like this. And, you know, in the Paramo in Colombia and Venezuela, you have also these Espoleti, this really charismatic plant genus. As you go on down the wet eastern slope of the Andes, um, these grasslands, including Paramo, give way to cloud forests, which are where I've done most of my field work. And they're the world's most species-rich habitat type. And they're super verdant, lush, wet, and cloud-filled throughout the year. And they're characterized by short trees and shrubs that are absolutely full of epiphytes, including orchids, mosses, ferns, bromeliads, like you see here. And as you keep on going down, the in, in elevation that cloud forest gives way to lowland rainforest including the amazon basin there on the western side which um while maybe not a species which is very um lush and vibrant and and absolutely um charismatic in its flora and fauna but not all andean landscapes are green <laughs> and and lush there are lots of dry habitats as well. And in fact, some of the most arid habitats are um, in proximity to the Andes. And this includes a lot of seasonally dry forests and really arid inter-Andean valleys. And it can be so dry that cacti can be a predominant growth form. So um, as to be expected, I would argue diversification is not um, homogeneous across these different habitats. And so we see that diversification has been really fast and really recent. We have clades that have um, originated in the last million years and less in the Paramos, uh, which makes sense because they're the top of the Andes. They're the most, the youngest habitat type in this, in this region. Um, and, and so this is the world's most, the fastest biodiversity hotspot. But we also know that the drier areas of the Andes are a little bit more relictual and the clades that they home are, um, that they house tend to be old and relatively slow evolving. Uh, relatively few 
cloud forest clades have been studied in the context of diversification. I think in part because there are lots of unwieldy clades that are native here, lots of just very high species richness, hard to, hard to infer phylogenies here that make the subsequent um, inference of diversification rates difficult. But here we use the neotropical bell flowers as a model to look at neotropical um, or Andean diversification. And first we established a time calibrated phylogeny. We showed that from the origin of the clade about 15 million years ago until about 5 million years ago, diversification rates remained relatively flat and relatively slow. But at 5 million years ago, diversification rates exploded. And we see that net diversification rates um, ticked up super quickly, coinciding with the origin of the Central Pagano clade, this group of 550 species. And in fact, this is a really special um, clade in terms of diversification rate. We see that the, the rates that we have estimated for Central Pogon are higher than other um, Andean lineages with fast diversification rates, including hummingbirds and those Espaletia that I showed a few slides ago. And similarly, they're also higher than um, many famous rapid radiations in the Hawaiian Islands, another area characterized by sort of young geology and rapid diversification rates. And, and lineages, those lineages include Hawaiian Drosophila and the Hawaiian silver swords. But what explains this, this really elevated diversification rate? Well, applying um, state-dependent diversification models, we found evidence that an association with vertebrate pollinators um, results in a six-fold increase in net diversification rate, rates as compared to invertebrate pollination. And similarly, that um, relationships with fruit dispersers, probably small, small bats and birds, is associated with a higher rate of net diversification than those capsular fruits that just sort of drop their seeds. And this suggests that mutualism specifically with vertebrates are really important to the diversification of this clade. But we also found um, evidence for, um, for the abiotic environment also driving diversification. And here we see, here we were really excited about this model because it's one of the first times geological data has been incorporated into a model of diversification. Um, and so we thought this was really exciting and novel. On this side, you see a model of Andean, pastel Andean elevation through time. Um, and at the right, you see the results of our analysis, which is basically an extension of a birth death model, but instead of modeling through time, we model against a time dependent variable. So the elevation here. In our best fitting model, we find that extinction is not a significant parameter. We have a pure birth model, but we see that speciation instead, it seems to be very tightly linked to past elevation of the Andes. Um, really exciting result. And though not surprising, because again, this has been invoked time and time again across to other uh, clays as well. This result was corroborated by two other BISI analyses, one showing that Andean taxa have higher rates of net diversification than taxa that occur outside of the Andes. And similarly, those at higher elevations um, have higher rates of net diversification than those at lower elevations. And so across these series of diversification analyses, we were able to show that it's a complex interplay of both abiotic factors, um, climate and, which I didn't show, but climate and um, Andean uplift, but also biotic factors, those relationships with mutualists that underlies rapid diversification in neotropical bellflowers. And I would argue that's probably gonna be true in most lineages that occur across this really heterogeneous um, topographically complex area, um, clades are able to have so many species because of the scale of this mountain range and because of the, the many different um, uh, sort of ecological interactions that can happen within this, this matrix, uh, tax are able to locally adapt and, you and what results are these morphologically diverse species rich clades that characterize the tropical Andes. And we're beginning to see a similar pattern across other taxa as well, in which diversification, often of very um, morphologically rich uh, clades, begins in the late Miocene. And this coincides at the time at which those mountains were tall enough to begin to capture moisture coming in from the Amazon basin, forming the clouds that gives cloud forests their names. And so we see this in bromeliads, blueberries, passion flowers, viburnums, and even lycopods.
And as I mentioned before, I really do think that the evolutionary lability of different lineages to, for example, converge on, on hummingbird pollination or to shift fruit type to fit a different disperser has allowed the coexistence of so many species. And this allowed us to, we, with this framework, I was able to sort of me, uh, meld macroevolution with species ecology to understand at a macroevolutionary scale how evolution of pollination system, syndromes has proceeded in neotropical bellflowers. For those of you who are unfamiliar with pollination syndromes, there are suites of floral characteristics that are associated with the attraction of a particular floral visitor. In this clade, hummingbird pollination and bat pollination are relevant. They actually share quite a few characteristics in bellflowers. Flowers tend to be tubular, tubular and uh, produce a lot of nectar because both hummingbirds and bats um, are warm-breaded pollinators that do need a lot of energy to survive. The hummingbird pollinated flowers tend to be brightly colored to match sort of the high uh, visual acuity of hummingbirds. They're flowering during the day or they have diurnal emphasis. They don't have a floral odor and that's because hummingbirds don't smell very well. And, um, most importantly, so for pollination e efficacy, they have really um, narrow floral openings and hummingbirds are best at visiting the most narrow possible uh, aperture within the constraints of their um, bill size. So functionally, this is a very important trait. Bat pollinated flowers, on the other hand, tend to be pale at color. They might stand out a little bit um, at, at night, which is, of course, when bats are active and why we see uh, night flowering flowers or nocturnal emphasis in, in bat pollinated groups. They also tend to have unpleasant floral odors or at least tend to be very sulfurous, so um, kind of kind of skunky. And they have, importantly, a wide floral opening. And I like to think these bat pollinated flowers are sort of bat head shaped because the bats just put their whole head in when they visit. And so I'm going to really quickly show you guys a video of bat pollination because I, I think it tends to be the least familiar pollination syndrome that I talk about. So here's Centro Pogon nigra cans. It's flowering in the cloud forest of Ecuador. You can see it's a really wide flower or uh, corolla opening there. And these are its big old stamens just waiting to put pollen on the Anura fistulata bat that's about to visit it. You see as the bat puts its head in, it reaches its tongue all the way to the base of this 10 centimeter long flower. And as it's doing that, uh, pollen's being placed very specifically at the nape of this bat's neck. So just a really fantastic interaction. Maybe even more impressive when you realize that this bat has the longest tongue per body size of any vertebrate, which ha it has evolved to, um, to it's a product of coevolution with Centropoga nigricans. It's the only bat that's able to get to the bottom of this um, very long flower. And subsequently, Centropoga nigricans relies on this bat for, for reproduction. And so we're really interested in how pollination syndromes evolved across the clade, not just within a species. And so we collected a bunch of data relevant to pollination biology from herbarium specimens. And the first thing I did with that data was to pop it into a phylogenetically informed principal components analysis. This is a, <laughs> a beast of a slide, so I'll go ahead and walk you through it. But the overall take home is that pollination syndromes were really well supported in this clade. Here we see bat pollinated uh, flowers, uh, morphospace of bat pollinated, no, we have flowers um, that are bat pollinated in green, hummingbird pollinated flowers in either pink or white and species for which we know from really good pollination ecology, we know their pollinators have blue around the outside. Um, so the first PC axis is mainly capturing size variation and it doesn't do a great job of splitting hummingbird versus bat flowers, which is not surprising because they're actually pretty similar in size, these hummingbirds and bats. However, the second PC axis does a really good job of splitting um, bat from hummingbird pollinated flowers. And this axis, not surprisingly, is capturing more shape variation. We go from flowers that are wide, um, relatively short, and have big anthers um, on this part of the axis to flowers that are longer, narrower, and have small anthers up here. A third PC axis further separates species that are obligately pollinated by this wonderful hummingbird species here, Eutoxeres, the sickle bill hummingbird, and this axis is capturing um, variation curvature. 
When we put these results onto that phylogeny, we see, just like fruit evolution, pollination syndrome evolution has been really dynamic in this clade. We see that, ancestral that ancestrally, this clade was hummingbird pollinated. And here I'm showing you the product, or the, I'm showing you six species that are plesiomorphically hummingbird pollinated, meaning from the base of that tree all the way to the present, their lineage is inferred to have been hummingbird pollinated. And so I just want you to notice that the flowers, while there is quite a bit of variation within them, they are sort of overall similar in their, in their bow plan. Within hummingbird pollination, we have this origination of an obligate pollination by a sickle bill hummingbirds, this lovely guy, a single time. But it's um, not an evolutionary dead end, this obligate specialization, and instead we see multiple occasions in which a uh, relationship with this bird has been lost. And fantastically, we see that bat pollination has evolved about 14, po uh, 14 times independently within this clade. And here I'm showing you seven so fully half, um, examples from fully half of those independent evolutions of bat pollination. And compared to those hummingbird pollinated flowers, you can see the convergent um, origination of those flowers here. And they tend to be um, overall similar in those, those traits that we measure that are functionally really important, but there's a lot of personality to these flowers as well across the different um, uh, originations. And so not surprisingly, there's a suite of adaptive traits. Uh, we, we see um, evidence for evolution of pollination syndromes via the application of these ornstein uhlenbeck models that allow us to look at um, correlated evolution within pollination syndromes. So what this means as lineages shift from hummingbird to bat pollination, their traits change simultaneously as well. So for example, as we go from flowers that are long, um, long and have short peduncles, as is important in hummingbird pollination, we, um, as we shift to bat pollination, flowers simultaneously get wider and get those long peduncles that are so characteristic of bat pollinated flowers. And, but despite this really dynamic pattern of, of pollination syndrome evolution and this evidence for the macroevolutionary importance of, um, of these pollinators and driving morphological evolution, we don't see any differences in diversification rate between hummingbird and bat pollinated lineages. Um, and so I would argue that instead, like I said a few slides ago, it's this clade's ability to shift so readily between the pollination syndromes that has allowed this clade to host so many species. And this observation really motivated uh, my next research question, which is what role do pollinator shifts play in speciation within this clade? And this bit allows me to, to put together the microevolution and species ecology parts of that Venn diagram. And to, so to get at this, we, we studied a system in Bolivia of three different um, Centropogon species. Centropogon bretonianus, Centropogon mandonis, and Centropogon incanus, shown here a little worse for the wear after a day of riding in the car with us. Um, so they're all, all these species are endemic to Bolivia, but they have really different ranges within Bolivia. Centropogon bretonianus and mandonis, they're both high elevation species that are occurring at the highest extent of cloud forest right before it transitions to grasslands. But bretonianus it's a very narrow endemic. It's just found in, you know, a handful of populations outside of La Paz. Centropogon mandonis, on the other hand, is this widespread taxon that's found throughout this elevational band throughout Bolivia. Centropogon incanus is sort of like Bretonianus. It has a relatively um, narrow distribution, though not nearly as narrow as Bretonianus. But importantly, it's occurring lower on the mountain slopes than Bretonianus and Mandonis. This is sort of a low cloud forest species. And this was a really interesting study system for us because of where one of the species fell within the morphological space. And we see that Centropogon Mandonis, which we inferred to be hummingbird pollination, pollinated based on its red flower color, However, it was falling sort of on the outskirts of bat morphospace. And so that led us to ask, is this, what's, what's the better signal, color or shape? Or is there something more complex going on? So we set up a bunch of cameras in, in, um, to see what was happening with the pollination of these three species. 
and Centropogonum canis with its big white flowers we predicted would be bat pollinated. And we do see, in fact, that bats were really good and regular visitors to this species down at those lower, warmer elevations. We saw, we saw um, hummingbirds visiting these flowers as well. I want you to notice, however, that when this bird is going into the flower, it's not always making contact with those reproductive organs. And in a second here, it's gonna zoom down to this flower down in the bottom left. And I want you to pay attention. It's gonna enter that flower from the side, totally eschewing any sort of contact with the um, reproductive organs. And so this hummingbird, while it is a floral visitor, is often acting as a nectar robber in this system. It's costly to this plant. So not, not as good a visitor as that last bat, who even though it was a real quick visit, did a really good job of transferring pollen. So of course, we were most interested in what was going on in Centropogon mandonis. And we saw that hummingbirds do in fact visit this flower. So, you know, that's sort of what we predicted based on the flower color. But with that morpho space, we also thought bats might be good visitors. And to my delight, they were. Um, and, and so across uh, 243 hours of video, we see that there's a gradient of pollination specialization in this clade from primarily bat pollination in Centropogon and Canis to a pretty balanced generalist in Centropogon mandonis, which relies on both hummingbirds and bats for effective pollination. With Centropogon bretonianus sort of in that middle zone, its primary pollinator is certainly bats, though hummingbirds are important. Uh, secondary pollinators. And this was, of course, a really fun result for us because what this meant is that um, Mandonis, as a balanced generalist, that color and shape mismatch were sort of underlying its ecological generalism. So this really sort of interesting result where we were able to use macroevolutionary analyses to actually predict something about species ecology. Normally it's sort of done the opposite way. Of course, being an evolutionary biology, a biologist, I put this in a phylogenetic context, and it's actually, it gets even more interesting. These are each other's closest related species, and this is strong support in the entire phylogeny as a whole. If we zoom on into just this subclade, we see that Centropogon bretonianus and Centropogon mandonis are sister species that occur in sympetry, that are sharing pollinators, which is a really sort of stunning result. And their sister to Centropogon and Canis, with whom they share one of their key pollinators, and maybe individual pollinators too. Bats can certainly go up and down in elevation in a way an individual plant can't. Um, and, and this and Canis is, is of course occurring in parapatry to them. And so this is a really stunning result with very close relatives sharing pollinators in close geographic proximity. It's further, this pattern is further supported by phylogeographic results. And we find whether we're applying sort of this astral species tree framework, we see we have really strong support for monophyly of each of these species. And um, when we do PCA of the SNP data as well, we see that they're really sort of in different parts of, of that PCA space. So real strong support for monophyly. But when we analyze the SNP data in a population context, look for potential introgression, we don't see a whole lot of evidence of introgression within the system. Sure, there might be some cases of individuals that are um, maybe the product of hybridization or introgression, but it doesn't seem like hybridization is swamping out everything in the system. Like you might predict if um, these were closely relative species, related species sort of swamp um, that didn't have reproductive isolation involved. And so of course, we wanna know whether or not at this point, if this is, if these individuals reflect recent introgression or maybe this is sort of um, ancestral sorting um, and, and we're still analyzing this data. But a really interesting result that we have that's sort of hard to reconcile with that last slide is that using a method that looks at phylogenetic invariance to find hybridization or evidence of hybridization, we find really strong support for our hybrid origin of Centropogon mandonis, just sort of um, counterintuitive too, because it's the species that's sort of the most different. I was actually expecting that this species might be a hybrid. But if, if this is the case, a pattern that would be consistent with our structure results on the last slide here in this is a pattern in which um, 
Centropogon mandonis arose via allopolyploidy between two species and then through time was able to evolve sort of these private SNPs. Um, and of course, if allopolyploidy is invoked, is actually what's at play. Reproductive isolation would have happened at the time of origination. And so this is a potential um, explanation that we are currently investigating into what may be allowing these three species to coexist. But as we continue to analyze this data, we still have strong evidence that whether or not reproductive, they're completely reproductively isolated or if it's um, or if they are still able to have gene flow, we do know that pollen transfer is being minimized by morphological traits. Here we see that Centropogon bretonianus and mandonis have significantly different stamen lengths, and this is of course important because it determines placement of pollen on those bat and hummingbird bodies. But this difference is very much exaggerated in sympatry. We have about 10% shorter stamens when Centropogon, of Centropogon mandonis when it co-occurs with bretonianus. And so in this system, it seems like there's differential pollinator use that's mediated by key differences in floral shape um, and, and likely incompatible, a reproductive incompatibility that's due to potential hybrid origin of one of the, the players here that allows these three species to co-occur in close geographic proximity in this really complex region, providing some insight into what at a clade level may be driving this pattern of rapid diversification and sort of high species richness in the Andes. We're continuing to look at this intersection of microevolution and species ecology in the context of pollinator evolution in, in this clade. And here we're really interested, especially in that origin of the obligate interaction with the sickle bill hummingbird. And in this case, we're not just interested in the relationship between centri or Centropogon and the hummingbird, but its entire um, suite of food plants, which also includes Heliconia, which again, I studied as an undergrad with Chelsea. And so um, two members of my lab, Janet and Laura, are busy working on the system. Janet's establishing a phylogenetic framework for this clay, the Eucentropogonic clay that's pollinated for the most part, but not exclusively by sickle bills. And Laura's been really diving into a, a system within Costa Rica. Here we have Centropogon granulosus, this curvy flowered species, sister to Centropogon solanifolius. Um, these two species have really different floral, well, different enough floral morphology that it suggests that Centropogon granulosus relies on a single um, hummingbird within its pollinator community, whereas Solanifolius might rely on up to six species of um, hermit hummingbirds with curved bills. And, um, and again, we have this situation where we have sister species co-occurring with these really important differences in floral shape. And so Laura wanted to understand what might be allowing these two species to co-occur. So she took measurements across uh, from herbarium specimens that have been collected in Monte Verde, Costa Rica, uh, where these two species occur. They overlap at mid elevations, but Centropogon solanifolius, these circular dots, goes higher up on the mountains than Centropogon granulosus, these squares, which go lower down the mountains. And Laura did see a little bit of overlap in the floral morphospace between the two. Um, you see sort of, especially around here, you see a little bit of overlap between those circles and those squares. However, where species do co-occur on the mountain, we don't see any overlap. We see this gap in morphology. And so this is, again, a pattern consistent with um, character displacement following recent speciation. And had everything gone the way that we had expected, um, and I wasn't giving a talk on Zoom today, we would have been in, in Costa Rica over the summer collecting pollinator data and population genetic data for the system to really test that hypothesis. But hopefully soon. And we really think this is a great system to integrate macro and microevolution with ecology. And again, because we know the systematics, we're able to ask some really focused questions. And so most of my talks so far is really focused on that first prong, that really deep um, dive into a single clade. And I'm just going to end my talk by um, telling you a little bit of the research we're doing on more of that broad side and the taxonomy and evolution of neot um, understudy neotropical plant lineages, including these guys here. Um, so my lab is busy establishing the first phylogenies for these clades here, uh, Fresiera and the Pentaphyllocasee in the Aracales. A lot of people don't know that family. 
uh, Marista Casey, or Otoba in the Nutmeg family, Marista Casey, uh, Hilia and Peli Correa in the um, coffee family, Rubiesi, in this high elevation endemic genus of millistones and brachiodum. And these groups are really good complements to the neotropical bellflowers because they have different natural history, different environmental preferences, different ecological interactions. And so we'll be able to compare how they're responding to the different aspects of, of the neotropical landscape to really begin to understand a more integrated um, perspective on, on neotropical plant evolution. And I'm just going to quickly show you a few of um, the examples of the impact of the Andes on diversification in this group. So for example, in Brachiodum that Diego is working on, he sees that species ranges tend to be really, really narrow, um, even though spe species tend to be really, really different in close proximity. And what this suggests to us, these species ranges, is that once Diego finally gets that, um, that phylogeny he's currently working on, that we're going to see that um, the Andes have been a real motor for speciation, that allopatry um, in during mount uplift and Pleistocene glaciations has probably driven evolution in this clade. However, in other lineages, such as Otoba, which is more of a low cloud forest clade, um, we see that the Andes instead are a really important biogeographic barrier. Since the evolution of this, or the origin of this clade, it hopped over from Africa about five million years ago, um, it's only been able to cross the Andes a single time, which makes some sense. These are really big, big fruits that are pollinated by big bodied birds and primates, so those don't cross mountains very often. But the single time Otoba has been able to hop over the Andes, it became very well established and has become one of the 10 most ecologically dominant spe um, spe genera in the Western Amazon. And of course, in Hylia um, that my grad student Lamone's working on, she has really good evidence that the different ecological interactions that these species can have are really different depending on what the environment within the neotropics you're in. And sort of unlike in Centropogon where we see hummingbird and bat pollinated species going crazy in cloud forests, instead she sees that um, hawk moths tend to be really important pollinators in cloud forests. Which really gets to the fact that while we are searching for generalities, in, in Andean plant evolution throughout our research, there are also going to be a lot of wonderful idiosyncrasies that we find. And it's really by comparing differences between clades that we'll be able to tell a fully integrated um, story of Andean plant evolution. But I hope I've convinced you that the Andes, sort of their continental scale and that opportunity for local adaptation and tons of allopatry is really one of the key reasons why the neotropics are so diverse. And while I'd love to do field work in this amazingly beautiful part of the world, I actually end up spending more of my time in herbaria. And today I told you about taxonomic data, morphological data, distribution data, and DNA sequence data that I got all from herbarium specimens. Herbarium specimens are so important in becoming um, literate in a group to be able to ask to pose these, these big macroevolutionary questions, and they're a continually broad source of data um, of very different types as well. And so it's been really great being able to be, um, to, to spend time in Herbaria. And so with that, I'm going to say thank you, including to those institutions that I visited to be able to collect the data. Those are very listed below. I want to acknowledge my amazing lab who's um, sort of diverse perspectives and just the ways they approach science have really pushed me as a scientist and as a mentor. And of course, I also have fantastic co-authors and have had luck in the field and with funding. And so with that, I have no idea if I, oh, I think I might have time for questions. I can take any questions. If you don't want to ask a question in this public Zoom format, feel free to shoot me a question. Um, at my email address up here or find me on Twitter um, and I'm happy to talk one-on-one -on -one as well. So thank you. I think I have to leave this to see if there are any chat questions. Those, um, the clap emojis make me happy. <laughs> yeah, so if anyone wants to ask any questions, feel free to unmute and ask a question um, or uh, you can place it into the chat. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, hi, hi, Laura. Can you hear me? 
I can. Uh, this is Gaurav. Hi. How are you doing? Um, so we, uh, in our discussion, we spoke about how self-compatibility has evolved in, in certain habrochites in this area. And actually, there are two species that have passed the Amutapehuankabamba zone, uh, again in Solanums, which have evolved from self-incompatibility to compatibility because they have been moving through the Andes. And I was wondering what is the general frequency of, of shifting from not just the pollination modes, but also from self-incompatibility to compatibility in, in different systems, uh, if you come across that information. That is such a good question. And one of those, so this morning when we were talking, I was like, I wish I had that data for all these species because the system you're working on, you do have so much data. Unfortunately, I don't have all that data, but I can tell you that in general, species of Lobelioidae tend to be um, self-compatible, though they tend to not be self-pollinated often because of the morphology of their flower. And so um, these are, um, Two phase flowers. First, we have it in male phase, and that's sort of this is actually really early female phase. But um, when I wonder if there's a better slide for this. Well, we're gonna use this. Pretend that and you don't see that sigma popping out there. And so there is a this phase where pollen's gonna be taken out of the flower first, and um, only after that do we see the, the stigma coming out and opening and being receptive? And usually that stigma doesn't come out until pollen has been um, shed completely. And in fact, it's part of, part of like the a constraint of growth of that, um, the, the stigma column is that it's pushing against pollen and until pollen release is, is, is released, it can't really grow out. And so, that's sort of my frustrating answer is that I don't think shifts are going to be super important, but it has definitely not been studied in much detail. I can tell you that there are hybrids between species, so it looks like it can be fairly hard to evolve. Uh, or it's not always, speciation isn't always associated with reproductive isolation in this group. And I think that my postdoc advisor, Nathan Muchala, is looking at these sort of pat potential for hybridization across species, which might give some insight into that. But we really don't know anything about mating system in, in this group. Thank you. Yeah. I wish we did that. Hi, Laura. This is Joyce. Can you hear hey. me? I can. How are you doing? Hi. Thank you for that great talk. That was really inspirational. It's really nice to see you. Um, I wrote down two questions, one of which you answered uh, while you were talking, which is always great. And then the second question um, was about the, the, the three species that you looked at uh, with the uh, red, yellow, and white colors, and you had some really interesting results there. Do you ever, the first question of, pertaining to that is, do you see intermediate colors between those three species? Um, that's one question, and I asked that because uh, you, you said this kind of briefly that when two of those species are in sympatry, um, the, the stigma length are, are more exaggerated. Did, could, do you also see other floral traits related to their pollination syndrome that are also exaggerated, such as the color? Or is that data not really possible because you're mostly working with herbarium specimens to get like kind of enough, enough data? That's a, that's a really great question. And I will say that there is a lot of color variation within these species. I'm going to come yeah. right back to the slide, but really quickly to show you sort of, this is all variation within Centropogon bretoniana, so it can be, and, and you know, on the other extreme, like it can be pure cream and it can go all the way to like trying to look like Mandonis, but okay. plenty of morphological characters support that. So there's a lot of variation within in Bretonianus, which, and I wouldn't be surprised, we did see quite a few hummingbirds and bats visiting this species and, um, and I do think in this, you know, in our data, it was hummingbirds and bats were both important. So I think that's being a signal here. But flower color is also something we were hoping to look at a little bit more in detail in this, um, in Canna species as well. Um, so initially in my postdoc, I wanted to go, you know, do what all young optimistic evolutionary biologists want to do and go show that there's sympatric evolution, <laughs> sympatric speciation going on. Because when I was a graduate student, I collected these two individuals in the same 
um, populate along the same habitat, like basically growing next to each other. And this had wide flowers that were skinky and white, and this had narrow flowers that were pink. And so, um, unfortunately, when I went back to Bolivia to do field work, this had been taken over by Canna, actually, Canna bangii, another Zendra bareilly. Um, and so it just, you know, that, that question, the ability to ask that question specifically disappeared in between 20, I think 2010 and 2015. But I think that color evolution and color being a signal is really important in this group. And in other lobelioids, um, including closely related Burmeistera, also in Iochroma and Zelenaceae, the different colors seem to be playing a signal to the pollinator. So I think it's super important. And I think that in this clade, for whatever reason, the Peruvian and Subclada Central Pogon, it does seem that it is particular, part, particularly labile and very likely might be one of the reasons why floral morphology can be pushed in one direction because of that plasticity. Would love to spend more time with this system. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Laura. Uh, thanks for your talk and showing all those nice pictures that feel like home to me. And uh, <laughs> I, I have a question about the um, phenology. For example, in, in that case where you have all these sympatric species, do they show like different uh, times for flowering or something like that? Or they are like just simultaneously flowering? Um, so we haven't looked at that with that much detail. I can tell you. So I went to the field twice for this research and mm -hmm. in December, and Canis is in flower and Mandonis is in flower. I don't think for Tomianesis. So I do think there is a little bit of phenology going on. But when mm -hmm. we went back in March, they were all in flower. So okay. it's not 100% um, like, you know, it's not this perfect one goes on and the other comes on and they're sort of temporally isolated. Um, mm -hmm. There is definitely overlap. And we tried to look at herbarium specimens to see if there is good evidence of, of phases, but there just isn't the, the bulk of data you need to really do that. But I think that would be, you know, if I had more time in the system, in addition to color, I think looking at a full year sphenology would be super important as well. Yeah. And, and, and another like quick one is, uh, did you find that uh, like, I don't know, for example, how, how specific are those, those pollinators for each species? Do you get like, I don't know, 10 species of bats visiting the same, the same species and the same thing for hummingbirds? Yeah, so um, we unfortunately weren't able to look at the bat, get bat species identification because I didn't actually collect any um, mm -hmm. pollinators unless we didn't have the permits for that. So, but there are mm -hmm. two species of bats that occur in the area and my postdoc advisor who, is a bat guy, um, thought that it was just one species, but like that's only speculation. But with the two, um, with, with uh, the hummingbirds, uh, there's only one species that visited uh, the low elevation species, and then there are two different hummingbird species that visited Bretonianus and Mandonis. And we think those two species might have been the entire hummingbird community at these two, because it was pretty high elevation. Those were the only two we saw. Um, and I talked to some bird people who sort of confirmed that seem likely. Um, but in general, I don't really think these are super specialized for any specific pollinator. I don't think that happens often, though I've touched on two cases in which there is sort of that co-evolutionary link that occurs. And one would be that, that, that video I showed you from National Geographic mm -hmm. with, uh, in Ecuador. So Central Pogon Niagara Cans with 10 centimeter long flower, which like take out your ruler and look at that sometime. That's long, that's a long flower. So that's like a co-evolutionary ratchet that happened where, where there is real good specificity. And then the other case, of course, is in the Central Pogon Heliconia sickle bell system, where it's probably a one-to-many relationship between one bird and maybe five or six individuals, species, and five or six species within a community. Right. So. Yeah. That's great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Well, we're, we're out of our time, but I just want to thank Laura again for coming and giving us this uh, inspirational seminar. I think it was fantastic to see so many bright pictures as we move into our fall season and our bright leaves that we're going to have. It's great to see all the flowers. And um, uh, if anybody has any questions, as Laura said, feel free to email her or uh, find her on Twitter. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 
This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.